I'm really excited. Um, I'll probably preach 40 minutes tonight, but you know, whatever, mom. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm very honored to speak to you guys for just these powerful 15 minutes. You know, something that we want to talk about is the strong. That's the message title for tonight. And it's beautiful to see how our city has rallied together for one another. You know, you see everywhere, it's worse. Hashtag SOG is strong. Um, and tonight we want to talk about being the strong. What does that look like? And when you hear the word strong, I wonder what comes across your mind. This is what comes across my beautiful brain as Alexis Cerise before going through my process, hallelujah. I thought the word strong meant someone who isn't afraid. I thought it meant someone who doesn't complain even if they're in pain. I thought it meant someone who can bench press 300. Um, I don't know what the bench press levels are, but uh, to me that's a lot. I don't even do a squat, like I could barely go down on that one. Um, or someone who has never had problems. But what I've come to find out is that strength is more than just a physical feat. It's actually a heart posture. It's mental, it's physical, and it's emotional. And you want to know something? Strength comes from when you can be united in the mental, the physical, and the emotional. You can't just come here to church sometimes and just be like, yeah, it's my deliverer with your little hand. But you can't go deeper inside to see what issues do I have so that I can become strong. And I was number one at hiding all my little mistakes. Everyone would see you know, us and be like, wow, like we want to be you. And I'm like, are you sure if you knew like things? <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not throwing ourselves out there into the bus. <laughs> but you have to be okay with looking on the inside of you. What is strength? It's mental, it's physical, it's emotional, and it's okay to cry and do all those things because that's called a process, that's called life. Um, so let me tell you what I see the word strong means to me now. It's changed amazingly. Someone who is afraid yet shows up every day to see another day or chooses righteousness over popularity. To be strong means someone who is in pain but knows how to cry before the Lord and have the right people around them. Someone who's strong is someone who takes care of their physical body, health, and exercise. And I'm on this keto diet that my lovely boyfriend in the front, so handsome with the yellow beanie, <laughs> got me hooked on keto. And I'm keto day two, and I'm finally not cheating. And I was like, yeah, I lost two pounds of this little portion right here. And it is food portion, I trust, trust me. You need health and exercise to be strong. It's not only trying to look good because what you see on Instagram, please, there's a bunch of amazing Photoshop apps that you, that you can use for that. I ain't gonna take anything away when you meet them in person. Um, <laughs> and then the last thing, it's someone who faces their problems with all courage, knowing that God is with them. And this is something that I learned this year as um, I've been processing a lot in my life. And it came with a lot of pain, and I'm going to be very open and real because I'm in that Go journey. For, um, for me, strength was those things about not being afraid, about having it all together. And then this year was the first time I've ever dealt with depression, and I had no clue what the heck it was. I was like, Mom, I'm feeling sad. Like, every single time I wake up, I don't want to get out of bed. I can't even work. I'm sitting in the work area, like, fiddling with this hand. Like, <laughs> I'm not doing – no, this is real. I'm not doing anything. I'm having panic attacks. I have three mental breakdowns a week where I'm banging on the home floors of my house because I want to run outside of my body because I can't be here anymore. And what I thought that, I thought that was weakness. But then I came to a point where I was sitting down and I told God, like, I can't do this anymore. I'm hurting myself. I'm hurting the people I love. And I just don't feel strong. I feel weak. And so I was sitting on my bed and I remember I was like, I can't God, but you can. And then I literally heard the voice of God tell me, no, you can, Alexis, because I can. And if he lives inside of you, can't shouldn't be in our vocabulary. It's even biblical. It says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. And that's why today I can tell you that, I mean, I've been on this process for six months now, I can say, um, where a lot of strength has come out of it. But two months of surrendering to God, and that's where I found that I'm strong and I can help someone else. And so just know this, you facing things, you processing things is the most bravest thing you could ever do. And that's what strong means. Um, so how do we become this? Um, and I have points for you, just like my little daddy-o does. You can put those on the screen. 
<laughs> if you're watching this, Dad, just kidding. Um, number one, we start with ourselves. You start truly trusting Jesus and begin to face things day by day with his help. Don't think about tomorrow. Don't think about the next week. I freak out. I can't even do that. Literally every night, whenever I make it, I'm like, thank you, God, I made it another day. And that's how you do it. You face it one day at a time. And then number two, surround yourself with the right people. Who is in your circle of influence? you got to look at that. Even if you're 35 or you're 60 years old, there's still people around you. And you need to know who is around you that's influencing you. And number three, you be strong for one another. Uh, no, I'm sorry. What did I say to y'all? Praise the Lord. You be strong for another person who cannot at the moment. That's how you become strong. You first look inside. See what are the things that you need to deal with inside first. Number two, you surround yourself with the right people. If you keep on going out, you're doing your own thing, you're doing the shooty, shooty, bang, bang, whatever it is, you know. I like to drop it down like it's hot, but I don't do it in no clubs, y'all. I do it in the safety of my home, and Jasmine and Meanie can attest to that. But I'm being real. And then you be strong for another person who can't because there will be days where I'm not doing well and then my friend Jasmine over there in the back will be like, Alexis, you can make it today. And I'm like, okay, I can make it today. And there's be days where she's not doing well and I'm like, friend, you can do it today. And I can tell you that's amazing. That is called good friendships. Those are solid friendships that God gives you. And you be strong for the person because you weren't meant to be me-centered all the time. You were meant to be there for each other because that's what God, it says he's there when two or three or more are gathered together. He lives in you. Unity. He dwells in unity. So it's time to stop bickering. It's time to stop gossiping. It's time to stop messing around and start having unity in our homes, in our friendships, in our relationships. <laughs> Spitting all over you guys. Just kidding. All right. I love this true story about a group of friends that were the definition of strong for their friend. So turn with me to Mark 2, 1 through 12. When you're there, say holla. holla. Thank you, guys. I love it. Mom, I love your Wednesday night. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. Okay, ready? Okay, I'm going to read this slow. I'm not going to rush. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they cannot get to him, Jesus get to him. Dang, maybe I need glasses. Jesus, because of the crowd. <laughs> they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their face, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? That's what I imagine they're talking like. <laughs> He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. Let me tell you something. You're always going to have haters. You're not supposed to look like the world. You're in it. You're supposed to love, but you will always have haters when you choose to go with his route. It's the best route ever. I was so annoyed when I was reading these Pharisees, but I'm like, you still got to love them. That's how Jesus is. <laughs> but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This shows me that strength comes from people being united. There's four friends, a paralyzed man. I'm sure he was heavy super heavy and they're going all the way up on the roof digging the roof out and lowering him that's the definition of unity that they weren't they weren't wondering oh my god what are they going to think about us they're like no our friend is in danger our friend needs help and we're going to lower him to jesus no matter what it takes and they did anything and everything to get their friend to Jesus. It says they saw their situation, a crowded room, not even outside you can get to them. They climbed up to the room and... And those are the people that, those are the people we need. Those are the kind of people that you need to be doing life with. Or you have to ask yourself, are you that kind of person for someone else? Would you say that you could be that kind of person where you see Jesus or whoever it is and you take the time to stop and you help someone? We need to stop blaming all these other things and start looking inside. Are we the people who will just take a moment to stop, notice someone and say, hey, do you need help? How are you doing? 
And so to me, I'm like, man, we're searching for these people to be our friends, but can we be that friend to someone? That's strength, if you could be that for someone. And that's what people need. And let me tell you something. The way Jesus is there for people never made sense to, to the Pharisees. They couldn't believe that he would forgive the sins of man and heal him. So when you become strong in who you are in the Lord and are there for people, it dares you to forgive. It dares you to arise. It dares you to trust again. To people, it may seem crazy and not make sense, but it causes an amazement in people around you. When you begin to trust God, that's when it makes you, oh, you need to forgive. Like, dear Lord, I'm... A <laughs> I have five minutes. I'm good. There's moments where I'm like, oh, heck no. You Okay, there's one thing to know about me. I'm a very kind person, I can say. For those of you who know me, I think I'm pretty kind. But once you cross me, you cross me. No, I'm being serious. Once you cross me, you cross me, and you don't want to be on my bad side. But when you get to know Jesus even deeper, you can't help but forgive. I'm not saying that I have it all together and that I've forgiven people who have hurt me, but I'm saying it dares me to forgive. It dares me to see the best in people. It dares me to want to be there for someone who may have hurt me. It dares me to want to be there for my friend. It dares me to want to be a good child to my parents. It dares me to want to be there and support people no matter what they have been through. And that's the type of God that you serve. And that's the type of God that he's saying, I'm going to give you this strength. Um, thanks, girl. It says, we have never seen anything like this, and they praised God. We want people to say, we have never seen anything like this in the city of Santa Clarita. We want people to say, we have never seen anything like this in the Ruiz family. We have never seen anything like this in Lori's life. We have never seen anything like this in Katrina's life. We want people to say, I've never seen anything like this before. Because when you're with Jesus, it doesn't look like the natural sense of doing things. Um, and we need to come to an understanding that we're not waging a war against things that are only natural, but it's also in the spiritual. It's time to arise in the maturity of who we are in Christ. And the last scripture is Ephesians 6.10. You guys can turn there and say, yup. I know more of you guys are there. You just don't want to say it. Yup. <laughs> Get over your sophisticated selves. Just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Okay, Ephesians 6.10. <laughs> now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in you and through you. TPT version will just get you. Here's the simplified version. Another version says, finally, let the mighty strength of the Lord make you strong. Today, you're going to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and know who he is. And we have said it, and we're going to keep on saying this. We're Saga strong, we're Santa Clarita strong, and we are Jesus strong. Thank you. I need the other hand. Great job, baby. I'm proud of you. No, it is true. You know, um, as we were preparing, sometimes what we do is, I, I don't think humanity, we're ready for a crisis. You know, we, we talk about crisis. We talk about things. Uh, you know, we know that we're living in the end times, right? But if you think about it, the uh, disciples, were, they thought that they were living in the end times. And I believe that that's what they got to see many miracles. That's what they got to see the glory of Jesus. And we get to read it in the, in the New Testament, right? Because they believe that that was their last day. Jesus is coming. And I think we have become very relaxed and in our walk with God. And you know what? He, well, it's been like 23 years that I've been a Christian, so in 23 years he hasn't come yet, so you might as well probably have 50 years. So, you know, we, not that we think it, but we live it in that, in that sense. And, um, and personally, I know all of us are grieving, but for me personally, I am grieving with the parents and uh, in, the, in, the, in the children. And, and this is the United States. Do you know how blessed, if you were born here, whether you're a foreigner and you came here, you are blessed to be born in this country. I, don't, I wasn't born in this country, and I still love my country, but I come from a lot of, I have seen things, 
you know, since the age, I don't know, four until I left, until I was 16. So I just can I know how, to, how it is to actually step in shoes and see the shock of what our children are living, what our families are living, and the, and the terror and the fear that can change. It can change that person's life. But I'm here to tell you that we have good news in Jesus because it changes, it changes actually, it says that trauma, even if it's encountered once because it was so much tra traumatizing, it changes the brain of a person. And because many times we want to deal with just one, one aspect of our Christianity and we, and we take it and we should be strong spiritually. We need to be mature, not only spiritual, but like my daughter said, you need to take care of yourself, but we need to be strong emotionally. And I think, uh, I have read so many books, I think I should have PhD. If you have any hookups with any um, university, tell them I already read it. I should have a PhD in, in trauma, uh, in experience. But you know what he says? You know the beauty of it? It says that if they have a good support system, if whoever, even if not their parents, whoever they, they look out for safety, do you know that you can actually, your child doesn't have to be traumatized for life? Do you know that we don't have to live in fear? And I'm like, my gosh, we do have the answer. We are able to be strong. But that's not just in come just like, okay, that the word of God says, and now we practice it. And I think many times, like, we, we are shocked at what's taking place. And I think, I'm just going to be honest. Everything that I have read and is, and is confirmed by um, neuroscience and everything, and it has to do because families do not want to talk about emotions. We say, like, it's shocking, but how is it that we, and I'm not talking about this, in our lives, anything, whatever problem, we, one day, let's say it's, it's a divorce, one day you're like, I'm shocked where I'm at. Well, not really. It's just that you didn't want to see the issues. It's because we were too afraid, you know? Or one day your child just, like, goes ballistic and wild, and you're like, I don't know, he was so good. No, you didn't see the signs. And it's not that you didn't want to see the signs because you didn't want to. It's because it's messy doing life and being strong in Jesus Christ. It's messy. It's messy. And so I'm going to give you a scripture because some of you are like, mm, is that really? Yes. Proverbs 18.10 says this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. It doesn't say, it doesn't say the name of our own name, we are the strong tower. No, it says that the Lord, if we serve Jesus, he is a strong tower. And it says the righteous, where's the righteous person? If you have Jesus, he has made us, he has made us blameless, whether we suck as parents or not. Or whether we, you know, like we're in church, we can say those words. I know you say worse outside. So... We don't want to face who we are or, or like, we don't want to face things. So maybe we don't even need to, need, excuse me, we don't even know how to deal with confrontation. We don't even know how to let our kids be emotional or even ourselves. We don't give permissions to feel because we want to show what Alexis said that, you know, and to be honest with you, for many times, that's what I thought that strong was. To be a strong woman means, hey, I'm going to put up and shut up. And what does it mean? Does it doesn't mean that people are hurting you. No, you put up with life. And you shut up about it. And But Jesus is not that way. He says that when we are in need, we need to run to him. And he's our safe place. So even, let's say, even now we have, we have the answer. Let's say a child experienced something really traumatic or you experienced something traumatic. Maybe they don't have their parents anymore. But if they can get three people, three people that you commit yourself to that person, you can say, you know what? Oh, we're going to see you through this because my God is able to relieve you from the pain because my God is the one who took every infirmity, every pain, every shame, and that's why you and I can overcome. 
I believe that my story is coming now, not because it just happens to like, oh my God, it happened to me so many years ago, but now I remember, and, and I believe that it's, it's for a purpose. I believe it's so I can awaken, and I can, I can honestly tell my daughter, no, you need to process, and I know people hate that word process, but hey, life is a process. You don't get to be from one year old to 72 in three days. But we're expecting things to be easy. And, I, and I, I'm praying that this message is going to touch you. You're going to be encouraged. But it's also going to challenge you to say, how strong am I really in my emotions, in my spirituality? Because if we confess to be like super spiritual, then our emotional side should be awesome too. Our health should be great too. We're not saying we're not going to have any sickness, no disease, no emotions. But I'm saying we should be able to overcome because we know how to do it with God and we know how to do it in that community. God never created us to, for us to live alone. But I think so many times we, you know, this is happening and we want to just move forward. Okay, like, okay, let's, and I'm not saying this is what we're doing. Okay, so don't judge me. I'm just saying how we think. Like, okay, so should I preach today about faith? Because I don't know, should we move forward? Should we not give hope? And No, we carry hope alone. We, you and I carry hope. And I'm going to tell you, to be honest with you, for me has been very difficult. Difficult this past, how many days? Five days? Seven, six? Because I, 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 oh, I, I go there. And I'm like, but I refuse to allow it. If we're going to be united, we need to exercise unity. If we're going to be compassionate, it's just because you're a Christian. It doesn't mean like, oh, my gosh, I gave my life to Jesus, and today I'm so kind. It doesn't work that way. It's something that is developed. It's something that you cultivate. It's something that we need to exercise. I believe that one of the greatest strengths that we have, it's love and it's family. You know, I thought in times like that, people should be, we, we should be running to God, right? But running to God, it means running to the church because you and I represent the church. But because we don't know how to deal with it, we don't know how to, uh, to process all this and for those who are affected like, like very with your children to process all, all this it means that you're gonna have to cry with them you, you're gonna have to hold them you, you're gonna have to allow the shockness that they feel you're, you're going to have to and many times we're not there yet because we refuse to see our own shockness maybe not in a situation like this but in our past or in another in another experience that you have and we cannot be there, we cannot be the strength in our family because you haven't dealt with you. But then I'm expecting God to have a revival. I'm expecting us to walk in unity. I'm expecting that my kids are going to get over, you know, whatever uh, problems they're going through. And even if you're not a parent, your own life. Where are we in God? Uh, go to Peter 3a, please, First Peter. I'm trying to preach really fast. You're like, she preaches really fast. Sometimes, yes. It says, finally, all of you be on one mind, having compassion for one another. Do you know how hard it is to find people that, that will have compassion in some of our own situations? Because they've never been there. So we're like, oh, okay, like, okay. Sometimes all, you, all we can say is I'm sorry. And, and, and it's beyond that. It's beyond just saying, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just being there for people. Jesus was there always for people. Jesus was always looking to meet the need. What was it that that person needed? What was it that they needed? He didn't walk around, and I think I preached it last time. Like He, walked, he didn't walk around, you know, uh, when he went to see, remember when he went to see Martha and, and Mary and Lazarus got passed away he, he had died and then and those who those were Jesus had friends he knew how to be a friend and you know what I, I when I read it I thought he is the perfect example when it comes to friendship because you would think that if well if Jesus loves me so much how come he was late right 
He's like, you should have been there. And I think Martha said that you should have been, or Mary said, you should have been there. If you would have been there, this would have never happened. And she was like complaining because that's what, it's okay. He wasn't freaking out because she was complaining. He, he didn't slap her. <laughs> like, no, I'm married. <laughs> you forgot. Remember the last time when we had the supper and you were cooking, you were at my feet? He could have said that because we, we're good at remembering other people's things, right? Like, but now you're accusing me. I thought we were best buds. No, but he didn't go into that. But then, you know what I always, it's so beautiful because then, you know, read the Bible because it's always alive. And then you read Martha and Martha said, Martha had changed. Think about it. Martha was the one that busy, right? The busy body. She was always busy. Who's going to help me clean? She was like, a, you know, one of those people that need to have agendas, right? And if you don't work like them, then you're not good and they complain about you. But think about it, that's the story. So read that story, right? And so and Martha was so busy, but then Mary was at his feet. And I just want to, sometimes when I read that scripture, it makes me upset. Like I want to go get Mary, right? So a lot of people want to be like Mary. I, I was like, ah, Mary, just you, just, you were just lazy, right? <laughs> but that's my opinion, but that's not opinion of God. But then moving forward, who's the one who runs to Jesus? Martha runs to Jesus. You know what that meant? It meant that Martha changed. It, mer- it meant that when he corrected her, he took it upon herself of like, hmm, yeah, I can still do my task list and do everything and have the house clean and help Mary stop dancing with all the, you know how people dance with uh, flags? <laughs> I picture Mary like that, like, you yeah, yeah. know. It's like, okay, she can still do that, but you know, she still needs to help clean the house, right? And, uh, but at that moment, because we're humans, at that moment, Mary couldn't take it. And I'm like, but God wasn't, Jesus wasn't freaking out. Jesus just said, you know what? It says that Jesus what? Wow, you guys, that's the only small scripture in the Bible. Thank you. If you don't know any scripture, just learn that one. Jesus what? Why did he weep? You know what? Because... The Bible says that we should weep with those who are, who are mourning, with those who are weeping. You might not, you don't need to understand it. And sometimes I think we get it mistakenly because we feel like we need to feel what they're feeling. If someone is alone, I need to feel alone. No, it doesn't mean that. I don't carry their feelings, but I can say, you know what? I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And then you draw from your own experience because at some point maybe you were lonely. Not like that, but at some point maybe you were lonely and you draw from that place and I'm able to connect with that person. 